Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks! Hi, I'm Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, interviews with the living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, we're going to be talking with Tabitha Williams. Tabitha reverted to Islam in July of 2019. She received her BS in hospitality, but has since switched her career to working in nonprofit, specifically with the youth. When not working, she spends her time learning about Islam, fighting for social justice, and tutoring young women. Welcome, Tabitha. How's it going? Hi, it's going great. We just had a huge snowstorm last night, and so I think we got eight inches here in Chicago. Wow. So, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, and so uh, we're down here in Arizona always doing our interviews, but you are up in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, actually, that kind of segues nicely into the first question I usually ask guests, which is, um, how old are you? Where did you grow up? And what generation, if any, do you consider yourself a member of? Um, I am 42, I think. I don't I I think I stopped counting after 35, but I think I'm 42. And um, I grew up in Chicago, um, left a couple times for work, um, but now I'm back. And if I were to identify with the generation, it would be X. Makes sense. And uh, yeah, so... You, you, we always ask our guests to send us bios, and so you specifically started with that you reverted to Islam in July of 2019. So I figured before I got into that actual step in your life, I would just start with, in childhood, did you have any religion growing up? I did. I was raised as a Christian. Oh, okay. All right. Did that, like, uh, take with you? Like, was that, like, something you were really into at any point? Um, no, it's like, okay, our grandmother used to come and pick all of us up, our cousins and sisters and brothers, and we'd all go to church and sit there and not really pay attention. Um, and then, so when we were, I think maybe till about the age of 12, she used to do that. And then as we got older, we're like, eh, I don't want to go to church. We don't want to go. And we used to always hide from her so she wouldn't know where we were. Um, and then as I got older, it wasn't really that important. Um, when I was in college, uh, I think it was maybe my junior year, I got back into it as a non-denomination um, and was did it for a bit. After I graduated again, I just was like, it still isn't my thing. Um, and then I didn't um, do anything about my religion until I turned like 39 is when I really got interested in Islam. And then the rest is history. Cool. So so what was going on? Like what, um, I mean, we're going to eventually ask you about your opinions of death and I don't know if they are going to be preceding Islam during it. Uh, but my, my question for now would just be like only speaking about religion and everything. What was it that attracted you to Islam and like how, what was going on in your life? I don't know. Like, you know, um, I don't want to get too specific on Islam, but like they always, they say that we are created. Humans are created with the need to, worship something be it a religion or capitalism or something or um and so i think because i wasn't doing that for a really long time um i don't know it just something just hit me it was like you know why are we here what are we doing here what is our purpose um and so uh as i was going about my life i met a few people who were muslim and um, started to have like, you know, just ask questions. And um, one lady who really um, got me to consider it is that she said how it was explained to her is that the people of the book, which is the, you know, the Christians, the Jews, and um, the Muslims, uh, it's like a tree. So the roots of the tree are the Jews. And the trunk is Christianity and the branches are Islam. And I just thought that was the most beautiful explanation. And so that's when I really got into it. Yeah, that is beautiful. Um, And I've heard like variations of that, but um, that's cool. Uh, So your grandmother had raised you somewhat religiously. So, so there wasn't a lot of pressure one way or the other. So when you decided that you were like interested 
uh, was there like a lot of steps? Did you have to go to like a school? I, I know nothing about this, so I'm. No, no. So basically, you just it, um, Islam. There's no such thing as blind faith, and so what they ask you when you go and you say, "Hey, I want to be," you know, "I want to become a Muslim," they ask it just questions of like, "Have you studied? Do, do you understand what this means? Are you being?" forced are you so they ask all these questions and then if you can if you respond i guess in the way the imam thinks you should respond then you can go and you can say your shahada okay i really want to get into like the what you phrased right before you said that you why you even like considered islam or any other religion which is that you started like wondering about your role here i'd love to just kind of hear about that period of your life, because this is what I think connects our listeners to our guests. And what I think really helps people is hearing about those moments, because it's not really important to me what you choose. It's more important to me that like I had that moment. And I think so many other people have that moment and it's, it's terrifying. At least it was for me. So how, how was that for you? I, I don't need like specifics of why it happened, but how did it feel like what was going on? It was just, I guess I was looking for something, um, you know, like nothing was really, I just there wasn't exactly a goal, um, you know, like I just, you know, I went to work, I went home, I went to work, I went home, I went to, you know, so that's basically what I did for the, for at least most of the days of my life. Um, and it's like, what, what else is there out there besides, you know, um, you know, when I was in hospitality, it was literally like work drinking, going out with friends, going out to clubs, partying all the time from, I think, until from, I I think it was 25 to 36. That was my life. Um, And so there has to be something else. Like, what did I give to anybody? Um, What did like you know there is this quote i'm not sure if i say it right that you know you have to leave the world better than how you found it and that was a question like "Eh, i wasn't really doing that i was having a great time though but i wasn't doing any of that yeah yeah i mean i could totally relate and um i was also in the hospitality industry for uh 10 years about and it's it's not that i that industry is bad or good. It's that there's a common theme in it of like, you know, hanging out and partying after work and all that. And it's, it's hard to avoid that. And then also I think I, I agree with you. Like it doesn't sometimes feel like there's a lot of purpose going on. Um, so now you, because I know you and I've, I've talked to you, you, you are purposeful and, and you're full of like joy and enthusiasm. And you even said that you switched careers and now you're helping others. So how much of that has to do with religion and how much of that just has to do with Tabitha being awesome. And that's just your personality. Oh, you should, oh my God. Anyway, so um, I started um, working in not for profits, I want to say uh, like three or four months prior to me really getting interested in um, Islam. And so it just kind of, it was it just, it, it was one of those things where all of the pieces kind of lined up at the same time. And it, and you know, it, it, it was a very smooth road for me, I think at, at that point. And so, uh, now that you do nonprofit and, and you're in it, um, what's that, what's that like as far as purposeful and purposeness and stuff, does it give you like something deep? Are you experiencing what it was that you were searching for? Or is there still like, a search for that um no it's it's you know it's the need to the need to have to always as you're in hospitality you know have to always appease someone or something or some something else that wasn't that's not there anymore it's more like what do i have to offer what can i pass on um to someone else for the better so you know being able to raise money for any type of any one of our events or just teaching the kids a new experiment or talking to a parent who's having a problem with rent or um, any of those things it's it's the feeling of being able to support 
someone who is lack of a better word, less fortunate than I am at this point um, is a lot more re rewarding than me coming up with a new drink cocktail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. That's cool. That's very cool. Um, and so like, do you have, um, it's, it sounds like such a weird question to ask, but like, do you feel like there's enough people helping people right now? Do you feel like these movements are working? Like, I, I know that they've existed before and they're going to exist in the future, but like, I'm not on the front lines and stuff. How do you, how do you feel about this non nonprofit work specifically like activism? Um, it's never ending. It is, it is, it is, it is never ending. Um, but it's like a good, like, again, because my, point of reference or the other point of reference is hospitality. So it's always going to go back to that. But um, when we had like St. Patrick's Day, you know, at the end of that, especially in Chicago, it's like this huge celebration. And so by the end of the day, you're exhausted and like, oh my gosh, I just want to sleep all day. But when I am on the front lines fighting for something that someone in the in our community needs, you know, the work is still hard and, and, but I'm not ex exhausted in that way. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, we did this as a community. We came together as, you know, together and, and made whatever it is happen. So it's a different kind of tired and it's very, it's, I don't know, it's, it's much more uplifting on your soul, at least on my soul. Yeah. And so actually that's the perfect segue point. Cause I do want to talk about the soul and these concepts that go beyond here and now and like doing work with people here. So I, I would lo love to just ask you our standard question, which is what do you think happens when we die? <laughs> um, so we are taught that. So once we die, we, we enter the fear after the Akira is what they say. It's, it's what you call it in um, Arabic. And uh, so we're in the grave. And once you hit the grave, you have, there's two angels that come to you and they ask you three questions. And they ask you, you know, who do you believe in or who is your Rob, which is who is your Lord? Okay. Um, the second question is, um, what, do you, what, what is your religion or your deed? And then the third question is, who is your prophet? And so depending on how you answer those questions will let you, will dictate if you have an easy time in the grave or a hard time in the grave. Either way, there's a day of resurrection. And once that happens, um, you know, then, then you have to answer for your sins or your deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if that makes sense. So we just, you know, we're here, we hang out, we hang out in the grave until the day of resurrection is basically what it is. And so, like I said, if you answered in the affirmative, in the way that you should answer, then a lot makes it easier for you in the grave. You get a lot more room. He opens a window that is directly looking at paradise. And so you're there and it's easy going for you. If you answer not in the affirmative, then your grave becomes smaller and much more constricted and the window is open to you to help. So you're looking at that until it's time for you to be resurrected, either one of those scenes. Okay. And then ultimately there's like a resurrection. Um, and so yep. have you, have you ever like been tested in the time that you've had this faith and like this has comforted you? Has this like, or is this just kind of like something you believe in and you know about it, but it's not right now going to be so relevant to you? Um, no, you're tested. Like I tested like every day. Like, and it's not like huge tests. Like um, one of the people I know, he goes to Syria a lot to help out there and build houses and stuff. Cause there's a lot of people who live in the camps. Um, and so those people to me are seriously tested. Like they get bombed probably every other day. 
Um, and so they still, and he says it's unbelievable because they hold strong to their belief in Allah still, even though every day their houses are being bombed. And it's not even their house because they really just live in tents. But every day the kids are dying. The, you know, those people, that to me is a is really hard test. My tests are like, should I have that glass of wine? No. <laughs> so that's, so it's a different level for me of tests. Um, if that answer. So I yes, I've been tested, but I think that at, at this point, my tests aren't the same comparatively to someone who's in Syria or any other country in the Middle East at this point. Yeah, totally. And so I think, um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to ask you all these questions is I wanted our listeners to have exposure to Islam because we've uh, had a lot of guests and we don't specifically try to have one religion over another, but we want to have every religion on. So you're sort of an ambassador for it, but you're not like absolutely an ambassador, meaning like, of course, you're a person and your opinions are yours. But I, I would like to know, like, if people are listening and they're curious about Islam, like what would be maybe something you would suggest to them, either like why they should consider it or just even advice for what to do next? Like what, because uh, I'm sure there are people out there who want to know more and, you know, this country, it's not uh, clear at all, <laughs> like what to do. It's not. So it is not. So as I, you know, it's in Islam, they, they encourage everyone, women, men, everyone has to learn. The only way could be because like I said, there, there's no blind faith. And so you have to know what you're believing in, what you're saying, all of these things. So um, I would say if anyone is interested, right, there's so many videos on YouTube. Most masjids have like a visitor day where on Friday, which is our day of prayer, um, you can go and you can see for yourself um, what happens there you can most people are more than willing to talk to you and answer questions about anything you want to know um so yeah it's very once you actually start to research and and look into it it's very easy to find um information and people who want to talk to you uh for me once i started to learn um it's very different from what the West tells you it is. It's completely different. Um, what they show us is extremism. So people who don't follow the religion as it should be followed, that's who we see. Um, but like I said, there's more than a, there's like almost 2 billion Muslims in the world. And so, you know, something, you know, they're all not terrorists. We're all not bombing everybody. Um, and so, you know, you just have to, you basically have to find out for yourself and don't let the media tell you what it is. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great answer, actually. Um, and you got even more into like, things I'm curious about and want to know about. So, yeah, I feel like there's definitely a misrepresentation of specifically the religion, Islam, as well as I would say almost every religion, um, in not just in this country, but all over the world. So I am curious. Um, of course, I don't expect you to have like, you know, like a politician's answer. But like, what do you see is like the answer to all this conflict? Because, you know, I don't think it's realistic to say everyone's going to convert to like one religion over another. So what, how would you see conflict reducing across Earth, not just in America? Um, I, I guess like you have acceptance of someone's differences. Um, the Islam is very anti-capitalism and a lot of it, and if you really actually think about it, a lot of what happens in capitalism um, supports the you know all of the fighting and the wars and the differences and the, I'm better than you all of that stuff is definitely capitalism just from my personal research um but I don't I don't you know I can't I don't know I don't know I I you know I think having a willingness to 
talk and you may not have to agree with someone, but, you know, accepting it and being willing to listen to the other person's side and you can agree to disagree and move on. That's it. But, you know, no one's better than another person. I, I love your answer. And I think, yeah, acceptance of like things you don't want to hear and acceptance of how things are like there's two kinds. And again, I, I'm I'm repeating your answer out loud because I like it. I'm not the best at it. So, uh, but I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's fascinating. I think you've, you've lived like, you know, enough years to have made these decisions and then you're executing them and you've switched careers and you're doing all these good things. So I always give my guests like a opportunity to just kind of share whatever wisdom they feel like. So, um, you know, you have, People you've never met are going to listen to this and you have the floor. What do you want to tell people? Um, I think that you can, from my experience, you can always change. So nothing is like a waste. You know, we can look at our um, experiences and call it a mistake, or we can look at our experiences and call it, you know, a learning experience and, all all of my hospitality years helped me get to where I am now. Um, and so, you know, at 17, I chose what my major was. And at 38, I changed my entire career and that's okay. You know, cause I, we change as people and we can't be expected to keep that same career that same thing going through our 80 years on this planet yeah <laughs> totally um and i love that i love the quote we change as people because it's hard and i know you know i'm 40 something too or i just turned 40 um so yeah and i i feel like not just forgiving myself for the desire to change but having those changes was so important and so i love the way you phrase that and that's okay yeah exactly um and that is that's the bottom line is it's all okay i think uh, well i don't know if it, it's all okay but all of these things we're talking about and especially with like conflict in yourself and then conflict with the world um and you just touched on so much of it and uh i'm so thankful so uh tabitha williams from chicago thank you again so much for coming on the show and helping us put another nail in the coffin um i am going to be thinking a lot about trying to figure out this acceptance thing and i'm going to work on it and uh thank you for presenting it to us and our audience um for the rest of you listening at home once again you've been listening to coffin talk interviews with the living my name is mike oppenheim and we will see you soon